So this is Christianity versus world religions. This is lesson number one in this series and it's entitled Introduction and uh, Introduction to Unorganized Religions. Not organized religions, unorganized religions. For most of history, the majority of the world's population has not known the true God. Think about that for a second. We're here, we're in the Bible Belt. Churches on every street corner. Okay, they're not restoration churches, but they're nevertheless churches, all teaching about Christ and about the Bible. We're so, you know, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Surrounded, immersed in Christianity because of where we live, uh, we forget the idea that the majority of the world's population does not know uh, Jesus Christ. That the majority of the world's population follows man-made gods. In other words, gods that they themselves have invented and have processed uh, uh, and produced, if you wish, worship for throughout the centuries. Uh, Jeremiah and the other prophets uh, in the Old Testament lamented the fact that even God's own people were so often drawn away to worship pagan gods. He was surprised, uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, 20, that, that a people that God himself chose would actually abandon him and go worship a God that was invented by human beings. He, he often he was amazed by this uh, phenomenon. In this day and age, 60% of the world's population have not heard the good news of Jesus Christ, and they live without any religion and serve a religion that has no power to save them. That's the saddest fact in this whole course, that a great majority of the world serves gods that have no power to answer their prayers or to save them in any way. The Bible teaches that there is no salvation except through Jesus Christ. And I read this passage in Acts chapter four, verse 12. It says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among mankind by which we must be saved. You know, people sometimes say, what does it say in the Bible that Christianity is the only religion? Where do you get that idea that, you know, uh, other religions uh, are, 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 you know, people who follow other religions are not going to be saved? The Bible doesn't teach that. Show me a place where the Bible teaches that. And your answer is going to be in the future. Well, among other places, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. You, you can't twist this to mean something else. You know, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among mankind by which we must be saved. So the Bible teaches that there is only one savior. It acknowledges that there are other religions, uh, but it is very concise, very emphatic, in the idea that there is salvation uh, in only uh, or only through Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about what that means uh, as we go on and study. In the end, you know, uh, no matter how old the religion is or how elaborate it may be or uh, the ceremonies that it has, or maybe it has millions of followers in the end, it'll be destroyed along with everything else in this world when Jesus returns. Second Peter three, verse eight. So this being so, it is still important to understand what others believe. It's important to understand what other religions teach for certain reasons. First of all, for the purpose of evangelism, we need to be able to relate to the beliefs of other people for the purpose of evangelizing for the purpose of explaining Christianity. You know, Paul, the apostle, quoted the poets of Greece and made reference to their idols as a way of introducing them to the gospel. 
in, in Acts chapter uh, 17, uh, verses 16 to 31. So we, you know, we study other religions uh, in order to be able to be more effective in evangelism. We study other religions in order to avoid offenses. You know, knowledge helps us not to be offensive towards others who are not Christians. We, we need understanding if we are to relate to other people without insulting them. We can reject their beliefs without rejecting the people if we demonstrate some understanding of their belief system. That's why you know, if you want to be a missionary, if you're going to college and you decide I'm going to be a missionary, one of the things that you will study is the language and the religion of the place where you're going to uh, preach the gospel. I remember many, many years ago, I traveled to Israel to visit that country. And one of the places we went to in Jerusalem uh, uh, was the Mount, uh, where the uh, temple used to be, you know, Solomon's temple. Um, it's no longer there, right? It was destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman army, but there is something there now, and that is the Dome of the Rock. Every time you see a picture of Jerusalem, you always see this golden dome there. Well, that, that's not a Jewish building, that's a mosque. And uh, in those days, we, we were allowed to visit it. And our guide took us in, and uh, before we came in, we had to take off our shoes uh, I had to take off my shoes. I wasn't allowed to go in because the Muslims considered that mosque a holy place. The ground was holy. And so you, you weren't allowed to go in with your, with your shoes. And so I, of course, like everybody, I removed my, my shoes in order to demonstrate respect for their religion. I didn't agree with their religion. I could demonstrate different facets of their religion that were plainly false. But nevertheless, I took off my shoes. Why go out of my way to insult them? Why demonstrate uh, you know, a negative attitude towards something which they find important and sacred? And so we need to understand other people's religions in order to avoid offenses. Also, knowledge of other religion makes us appreciate the Christian religion even more. I mean, when you're able to compare the Christian religion to other religions of the world, you really begin to appreciate the superiority of our faith. When you put them side by side, which is what we're going to do in this course, we're going to put Christianity over here and we're going to break it down into its separate components. And then week after week, we're going to study different religions and we're going to put down the components of that religion next to the components of the Christian religion in order to compare them. You know, you go car shopping, right? What do you do? You, you, you take something for a drive and you compare it to something else. Well, if you compare Christianity in a systematic way to other religions, it's like comparing a BMW to a, to a bicycle. I mean, really, you don't appreciate the value of Christianity until you actually compare it to other religions. And that's what we're going to do. And so this brief course has Several objectives. One, we're going to give you an overview. Can't get into detail. I mean, you know, we don't have enough time. But we'll give you a good overview so that you'll be able to speak with some intelligence when you talk about other religions or if you meet someone that has a different faith than yours, that you'll have some understanding of their, of their faith. Also, to broaden your understanding of how other people think and what their religious experience is like. What is it like to be a Muslim? What is it like to be a Hindu? What is it like to be a Buddhist you know, in, 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 the modern, uh, in the modern age? And also to increase your faith as you grow in your application of the uh, Christian religion, how you uh, apply it in everyday lives, how you appreciate it for what it is, uh, what it is worth. 
Okay, so the dictionary defines religion, that term religion, the definition is man's expression of his acknowledgement of the divine. Think about that for a minute. What is religion? Man's expression of his acknowledgement of the divine. When a human being acknowledges that there is a higher being of some kind, he expresses that reality, he expresses that belief in some way. Well, the way that he expresses that belief is called religion, okay? Now the Bible writers uh, use the word religion in a different way. When you read the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, they use the word religion to describe the ceremonies that the Jews used to do in expressing their faith. So the various ceremonies that took place in the temple, in the tabernacle, so on and so forth, they referred to that as the Jewish, quote, religion. And wasn't it exactly what we said that the word meant? It was the way they expressed uh, 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 their feelings and their beliefs about uh, a higher being. The only difference is that God was the one who gave them how they ought to act. They didn't invent the way that they should act in the temple. The Jews did not invent the sacrificial system that they had. All of this religion was given to them by God. And that's why we say, you know, when we say a man-made religion, a man-made religion is a religion where all of the activity concerning that religion has been made by human beings. All right, and what we say about Christianity is that it is a religion that has been given to man by God. The things that we do are not things that we've made up, they're things that God has given us to do. Uh, and we find out about them uh, in uh, His word. When we talk about the religions of the world, we're referring to the different ways that mankind has developed to express his consciousness that there is something other than himself, usually something higher than himself in this world. We believe, however, that Christianity is not a man-made religion, as I said, but rather it is given to us by God. But for the purpose of this class, I'm going to put the Christian religion alongside of all the other religions in order to compare them. As I said, if you go on to, you younger folks, if you go on to college uh, and you're taking various courses, and especially if you go to Christian uh, university, one of the courses that you'll be offered is one of comparative religion, where you're going to compare Christianity uh, to Hinduism and compare Hinduism uh, to uh, Islam and compare Islam to Zoroastrianism and so on and so forth. Well, in this course, boy, we're going to do that in, in six very, <laughs> very short, very short lessons. Otherwise, it, it usually takes a, a lot of time. Now, um, uh, there are a lot of philosophies and movements uh, in the world, aside from religions, that come and go throughout history. And they have impact on society, but they're not necessarily religions. Uh, I want to mention a couple of these, not in order of appearance, but just to show you the difference between these things and religions, okay? So the things I'm going to talk about now are not religions, but they are belief systems that have existed and continue to exist in the world. The New Age uh, movement, the people at the back, you young guys, you probably never heard of the New Age movement, but the people closer to the front who are over 40 years old, you remember the new, the new age, uh, uh, the new age uh, movement. Uh, it was a, a, a combination of ideas from existing religions and philosophies and they kind of you know, mixed all these together and you had this thing called the new age uh, movement. They believed in the healing power of crystals and all this uh, type of business. Very, very popular in the 60s and, and in the 70s. Communism is a system of thinking, not a religion, but a very powerful system of thinking that still exists uh, in the world. It's a political and ideological movement, basically believes that everyone should have everything uh, the same. 
Everybody should own exactly the same, have the same thing. Nobody has more than another person. And it sounds like a really great idea. Wow, that's a good idea, you know. We'll erase poverty that way. You know, there'll be no more poverty. Everybody will have the same thing. Of course, every attempt at starting and organizing a communistic system has always ended up the same way. There's always some people that are more equal than others, unfortunately. The people at the top tend to be more equal and more comfortable than the people at the bottom. Uh, usually communism manages to make everybody poor. But anyways, this is not a class in political philosophy. Uh, but the communism, it, it, it's a movement and it still exists with us today. Naturalism is also uh, an ideology. It's an outgrowth of atheism. You know, atheism believes uh, there is no God, right? Naturalism is an outgrowth of atheism. And, and naturalism tries to explain everything in the world without reference to God. Basically, that's what naturalism is. It tries to explain everything that is happening without any reference to God, all right? In naturalism, man is at the center of everything and everything emanates from man. And then more recently, we have what I call climatism. Climatism, uh, there's no God in climatism either. Uh, this world uh, is all there is. And so therefore we must maintain this world in order to survive. Uh, it's not a religion, but it's almost like a religion uh, to many uh, individuals, especially uh, in our day and in our time. The goal is always to maintain the world, the earth where we live, the environment that we exist in, uh, and um, uh, that uh, all political uh, ideas uh, all economic ideas ought to be focused on maintaining and saving uh, the planet. So these and others have had influence uh, on the world, uh, quite a bit of influence on the world, but they're not actually considered religions. They're not organized religions. So these are not uh, the things that we're going to study. But I did want to mention that you know, these, uh, these ideas here do have a lot of impact in the world. In order for something to be a religion, it has to have certain features. Like in order to call something a car, right? It's got to have wheels, you know? It's got to have a motor. It's got to, you know, they're basic things you have to have in order for something to be designated as a car. Well, in order for something to be designated as a religion, it also has to have some features. Let me give you a list of those features, shall we? It has to have, first of all, history and origins. All religions can trace their origins to a place or to a person. All religions have this in common. Number two, all religions have a concept of deity. In other words, the main feature of religion is that it acknowledges the existence of a higher being or a higher power of some kind. And we'll get into this as we study the different uh, religions. All religions have a concept of mankind. In other words, a key question that most religions try to answer is, where did man come from? And each religion has an explanation of some kind that tries to explain where has man come from. When I say man, I don't mean men, I mean mankind, human beings. Where do human beings come from? How did they get here? And how did they get into the situation that they're in? Every religion has an idea about that and tries to explain that. Number four, every religion has a concept of salvation. In other words, something that the religion does to make life better in some way. Each religion has its own answer to the problem of the human condition and some offer of a better existence. It explains why there's suffering and death 
and all religions have some idea of what may happen after death, if anything. Number five, all religions have worship of some kind. I say all of them, not all of them, but most of them, okay? Most religions provide their own ceremonies that express their faith and uh, things that are done individually or collectively as a group in order to participate in that particular religion. All religions, number six, have scriptures, holy books, all right? Religions keep records of their founders, of their teachings, of their history, of their worship, of their beliefs. They all have holy books of, of some kind or another. And then seven, all world religions have, certain, have geography, but most of them have certain countries where they begin and where they flourish and where they exercise their influence. So if, if you're talking about organized religions, all organized religions have these seven features. Now, not all religions have all seven, but you know, they have most of them. And that's why they are referred to as world organized religions, okay? Again, not every religion exhibits each one of these features, but most of them have a majority of the features in common. The nature of our study will be to compare the different religions of the world according to these categories. So what you're going to get, not this week, but next week, you're going to get a handout sheet and it's going to say Christianity. And, and under Christianity, you're going to have these seven categories and we're going to fill in the blank for each one of these categories for Christianity. Then we're going to study another religion and we're always going to have you know, that original sheet that's going to have all these seven categories filled in for Christianity, but then next to it we're going to have maybe Islam. And we're going to look at the history of Islam and the concept of deity of Islam and the concept of mankind of Islam and the concept of salvation of Islam. And we're going to look at that and we're going to be able to see it next to Christianity. How does it compare to Christianity? How does Islam's concept of deity compare to Christianity's concept of deity? How does uh, Islam's concept of salvation compare to Christianity's idea of salvation. And we're going to do that week after week until we cover all the religions uh, in the world. And so our main study will be of the organized religions of the world. And people wonder, you know, how many are there? I've heard you know, speeches, even sermons, unfortunately, where some people say, there are hundreds of religions in the world. There are thousands of religions in the world and that unfortunately is incorrect. There are only 11 religions in the world. There are only 11 organized religions. All the religious groups are subdivisions of these 11 uh, organized religions in the world. And when you study comparative religions, they group them according to geography. Because when you study a comparative religion at the university level, the professors don't favor one religion over another. They just, you know, as far as they're concerned, they're all the same. They just, they just line them up one next to the other, okay? And we're going to study them in the same way. All right, so here are the 11 world religions. We start with the Far Eastern religions. And the ones in the Far Eastern category are Taoism, Buddhism, Shinto, and Confucianism. The next group are the Eastern, Far Eastern, Eastern religion, Sikhism, Jainism, Hinduism. And then you get the Near Eastern, it's not very difficult, right? Far Eastern, Eastern, Near Eastern. The Near Eastern religion, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, 
Christianity and Islam. So tonight I want to finish our lesson with a brief discussion of uh, what's called primitive religion, which does not fit into our pattern of organized world religion because primitive religions are very disorganized. Primitive religions have no unified teaching. You know, they don't have these seven categories. And primitive religion usually have no history, no founders. All they have are practitioners, okay? So before we study, as I say, organized religions that we're going to start next week, we're going to study unorganized religion, or as some people call them, primitive religions. So when talking about primitive religion, we're not talking about one religion in particular, but rather certain practices that are taking place in a variety of ways throughout history in different countries. So here are, like I showed you the features of organized religion. Okay, here are some of the features of primitive religions, okay? First of all, there is a strong belief in magic and the occult. Whenever you hear someone, you know, they talk about what's your faith, you know, and you start talking about religion with that person, you know, and they begin talking about magic, well then what their, their faith is primitive. It's a primitive religion because all primitive religions depend on magic. And, and if you're wanting a, a thumbnail description of what is magic, I'm not talking about the stuff that you see in the movies, you know, uh, that type of uh, you know, things, you know, uh, magic tricks you know, or entertainment. Magic, as in the occult used in primitive religion, uh, is the attempt to manipulate the spirit world from the physical world. In other words, you're doing something in the physical world that will somehow stimulate or manipulate what is taking place in the spiritual world. That's a brief description of what magic is all about. All right, uh, another uh, feature of primitive religion, there are no God or gods, only the belief that there are powers at work, good and evil powers uh, at work in primitive uh, religions. And then there are various forms of primitive religions. In other words, there are various ideas uh, that are uh, practiced within primitive religions. One of them is animism. Animism is where uh, people believe that certain objects are inhabited by spirits. The most common thing about animism is uh, your lucky charm, you know, your lucky rabbit's foot, my lucky hockey sock, my lucky hat, my lucky this and that. When you, when you say that, what you're saying is that a physical object is inhabited by some spiritual being or force to your personal advantage. Well, in religious terms, that's, that's animism, charms, uh, various objects you know, the, uh, that, that you believe have some kind of spiritual power within them. That's animism. Dynamism. Dynamism is impersonal forces that are at work in nature. Practice dynamism was practiced by primitive religions in one form or another. The Canaanites, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, they all practiced some forms of dynamism. Um, one of the principal reasons, uh, how, uh, not however, one of the principal reasons why primitive people would stay within a confined territory was because they believed that the trees were inhabited by spiritual forces, or the rivers were special. In Egypt, they believed that the Nile River uh, was a god. And so people didn't move away from where their local gods uh, were. 
Uh, they believed that the trees uh, uh, had power, uh, that where you bury your, where, where the dead were buried had special, not just special meaning, but there was special power that was taking uh, a place there. And so uh, they, uh, they uh, uh, not only uh, respected these places, the tree, the holy mountain, the special cave, whatever, uh, they also protected it. Uh, you, you couldn't trans, you, know, you, you couldn't, uh, what's the word, uh, trans, I've got, to, I'm, I've got to have way, you are uh, going across somebody's property. Uh, no trespassing, you couldn't trespass. Uh, uh, why? Not just because it was their territory, but because there were spirits there that inhabited these, these places. Well, if you want to know what is that, you know, well, that's dynamism. Okay, uh, fetishism, uh, again, practiced by primitive religions. Here, it is an object into which power is introduced by a shaman or a witch doctor, perhaps we're more familiar with that uh, term. Uh, uh, that was a fetishism. Uh, the common idea of fetishism that we might be familiar is a voodoo doll, right? The voodoo doll, where the voodoo priest sticks pins, right? The voodoo doll represents your enemy and you stick pins in the voodoo doll, right? And, 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 and in doing that, you're, 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 you're torturing your enemy in some way. Well, that's fetishism. Uh, you have an object into which some witch doctor, some special person has the ability to put spiritual power uh, into. It's also the belief that an object has a specific purpose, uh, whether it be a fertility or a protection against uh, evil. Uh, 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 all of this is uh, uh, included in uh, fetishism. And then there's um, uh, totemism. Totemism practiced more by North American Indians. Uh, here, various tribes of primitive people would associate the characteristic of animals with themselves and they would emulate this. You see it in the movies sometimes where uh, a Native American, uh, you know, where they're showing Indians back in, in, in the day where they would be wearing the coat and the head, if you wish, uh, of an animal, of a, of a fox or of a coyote or a wolf or something like that. And their belief was that in doing this, they were also embodying the power and the ferocity of that animal. And the totem poles that they would build uh, would be various uh, uh, heads of uh, various uh, uh, animals and also ancient uh, uh, people in their, in their uh, tribe. The idea is that if we render honor to the particular animal, this would uh, impart these qualities uh, to the tribe. Uh, totem poles, as I say, uh, represented uh, these elaborate and uh, special uh, qualities uh, uh, of the tribe by showing which animals uh, were on the, on, the, uh, on the totem. And so the further somebody goes back into history, uh, the more gods there are. It's very interesting. The further back in history, the more gods you, that you, you have to, to deal with. The first type of primitive religion, and here uh, I want to give you a little history of primitive religion. Okay? Just like we'll do a little history of Christianity, we'll do a little history of uh, Islam, I'll give you a little history of uh, primitive uh, religions. Good, very quickly. First type, tribal, tribal religions, tribal uh, uh, beliefs uh, 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 that were practiced 6,000 BC and forward, prehistoric if you wish. The families of the tribes developed their own systems, their own religions. Uh, tribal religions were nature religions where everything was interdependent with nature and so the religion centered on nature. You know, we study in the Old Testament, you know, the Baal, Baal worship. Well, you know, Baal was a, a, a local God uh, and uh, every town had a God. Every special spot had a God. 
and so the worship was always centered around the God, the local God. And it was always about the same thing. The local God brought the rain, made the, the cattle fertile, made the women fertile, you know what I mean? So the tribe could stay strong and could grow and so on and so forth. This was a basic primitive tribal prehistoric religion. Uh, they don't change uh, because nature didn't change. Uh, that's why there's no development in primitive uh, religion. Um, uh, they're integrated back to nature and a renewal is always a call back to the old days of nature. You see many times a call among uh, North American uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, the call back to the old ways is really a call back to the, the, the worship of, of nature and the gods of nature. The next major shift in pr primitive religion, uh, the Egyptians, 3200 BC. There's a progress there. They went from being a nature religion, uh, worshiping the sun and the river Nile. Uh, they began to develop mystery cults. They began to have priests who would you know, uh, be intermediaries with the people. Uh, they began national worship the worship of Pharaoh, Pharaoh was a god. Uh, and then they developed symbolism, the Sphinx and the, the, the pyramids. And so the Egyptians uh, developed their religion uh, uh, or their primitive religion into national religions. The next would be the Assyro-Babylonian religions. Now we're heading, now we're getting into religions. Okay, I've heard about these guys, you know, 2700 BC, the great thing, well, the great thing, the most important thing that the Babylonians uh, uh, brought uh, into the primitive religion was magic, was astrology, the study of the stars. Uh, they also had temple rituals and fertility rites. Uh, they also um, began to read. You know how you read tea leaves? Well, they didn't read tea leaves. They read uh, animal organs. And so their priests, their shamans, right, would cut open an animal, a sheep or something, and they pull out the liver and they would read the liver and somehow <laughs> reading the liver would tell them what would be taking place in the future. Or uh, if there would be a good crop or if the king would succeed and so on and so forth. The next uh, group that um, you know, developed uh, primitive religions that we see are the Canaanites. Now we're really, oh wow, we all know about the Canaanites. The Canaanite, their claim to fame, probably the most immoral, evil uh, religious practices of any primitive religion. Uh, they used uh, sex in their uh, religious practices. They had uh, prostitutes that would uh, be in their temples and part of the worship would be uh, that individuals would have sex uh, with the temple uh, prostitutes. Uh, they also did something even worse than that. They would offer their children in the fire uh, to the god uh, Molech. Uh, they were basically a nature religion, but their claim to fame was uh, how evil uh, their religious practices were. Then we get into more modern quote ideas, the Greeks, right? The Greek religion, 800 BC. They began as a nature religion like all these others, but they evolved through mythology. And so they began to have many gods and these gods began to have personalities. Primitive religions, their gods had no personalities. They were, they were just powers, you know, fertility powers and powers that gave us victory in war. Uh, but through the Greeks, these powers began to have a character, began to have actual, uh, began to have actual uh, name. And then the Greeks moved forward and uh, began to have a philosophical ideas uh, that they added uh, to their uh, religious ideas. And then when they were taken over by the Romans, they mixed the uh, Roman, uh, you know, the Romans mixed their religions with the, uh, 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 with the Greek religions and uh, the Romans took over the Greek gods, if you wish. And what they did is <laughs> they gave them Roman names. So the Greek god Zeus uh, became the Roman god Jupiter. You know? uh, and, and so that's how that evolved. And then uh, one more, uh, we have the Roman religion. 
500 BC to 400 AD, and I'm almost done here, let me just finish this up. 500 BC, 400 AD, the Roman uh, Empire, still a primitive in its style in that it was a mixture of nature, religion, and magic, and Greek mytho mythology. Eventually, the Roman religion was eclipsed by which religion? Correct, by the Christian religion. <laughs> This is one of the reasons why, for example, the Roman Catholic Church has uh, uh, many mystic practices even to this day. Candles, images, these things are just holdovers from the, you know, from the Roman religions uh, that were uh, being practiced at the time that the Roman uh, version of Christianity began to develop in Rome uh, 500, 600 uh, AD. Uh, today, excuse me, today there is uh, a lot of primitive religions still practiced in developing countries. Uh, voodoo in Haiti, for example. You know uh, Brother Jean Elmera, our missionary in Haiti? His father was a voodoo priest. He often tells the story of his father being a voodoo priest and practicing voodooism in Haiti. So you still have primitive religions in various countries, but researchers have found that as education and modernization increases, primitive religions decrease. Why? Because primitive religions are all about nature. They're all about taking care of food and making sure that uh, you know, there's not sickness and so on and so forth. So as there is a greater advancement in health and research and farming and so on and so forth, uh, people abandon the uh, ancient uh, religions uh, in favor of more modern um, uh, ideas, not about religion, but more modern ideas about how crops actually grow and uh, how sickness is actually cured. Well, that, believe it or not, is a very, very brief uh, introduction to world religions, and I've even squeezed in the history of primitive religions and how those have grown. But next week, we begin our actual comparative study of the various religions, and I do suggest that you pick up a, you know, a study sheet next week to fill that in, because you'll be able to follow along because we'll be, uh, we'll be going rather quickly here. Okay, so that's the end of our lesson. Thank you for your uh, attention. I appreciate it. All right.